President Biden earlier today announced that the United States will airdrop food and aid supplies into Gaza, as U.N. officials say that a quarter of the population, that is over 500,000 people, are one step away from famine. President Biden's announcement comes one day after Israeli forces are accused of opening fire on a crowd of Palestinians waiting for aid in Gaza City. The Israeli military denies firing on people seeking aid and says many of the dead were killed by stampeding crowds. At least 100 people were killed in that incident, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry, although the Israeli military disputes that number. The incident has nonetheless drawn international condemnation against a backdrop of more than 30,000 people killed in Gaza since the war began, again, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. This war is a source of domestic concern as well. This week, during Michigan's presidential primary, young people and Arab-American voters made clear their dissatisfaction with this White House position on Israel and Gaza, as more than 100,000 voted uncommitted in the Democratic primary. Joining me now is Senator Bernie Sanders. He is also the author of the New York Times best-selling book, It Is Okay to Be Angry About Capitalism, which is out now in paperback. Senator Sanders, it's great. It's a pleasure to have you in New York City. Um, I know that you have been openly advocated for this White House to do something immediate to help the people of Gaza, food and aid. They have apparently done that. Can you talk a little bit about how receptive the White House and the administration have been to outside pressure? Well, I think, first thought, this is something, Alex, they've been thinking about for a while, because what they see, what you see, what I see, is almost an unprecedented humanitarian disaster. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of children facing starvation. We're talking about Israeli bombs of making it impossible for humanitarian aid to get to places that is needed, uh, that the borders are being uh, blockaded, uh, and, and aid is unable to get through. So I think what the president is doing is an important step forward, but we need to do more. We need to tell Netanyahu and his right-wing government that they're going to have to open those borders. The United States of America, and I think the rest of the, the, rest of the world, is not going to allow hundreds of thousands of kids to starve to death. So we need a new approach to Israel for many, many years. We have given them a lot of money. Recently, there was a vote. I voted against it to give them another $14 billion. My view, not a nickel for Netanyahu's government uh, if he's going to continue this wholesale slaughter of the Palestinian people. That's the thing I can't really reconcile, right? We're airdropping aid at the same time as the U.S. is sending weapons of war over to Israel. I mean, how do you, recognize, how do you reconcile that? Is the right hand not talking to the left hand? You can't reconcile it. It's totally absurd. And on top of that, look, the airdrops are very important, but that is not as important as opening up the borders because you're going to need hundreds and hundreds of trucks every single day. And our message to Netanyahu, you know what? You're not going to get another nickel unless you open those borders and prevent the starvation, which is imminent. You say it's your message to Netanyahu, but I wonder if it's not also the message to President Biden, right? right? I mean, I, I have to read this passage because I think, you know, we don't cover Gaza every day. It is an ongoing, appalling situation. And this is what's happening for people who have tuned this out for domestic politics, which, of course, are important as well. But listen to this. It was hunger that drove Ibrahim Al-Rifi from his house in Gaza at 2 in the morning on Thursday. It had been months since he could find bread for his wife and daughters in war-ravaged northern Gaza. Flour sold for close to $1,000 a bag. And even the animal feed many had turned to was running out. Some people are eating grass, according to the United Nations. It is an unprecedented disaster, Alex. I mean, it makes my stomach turn when you think about it. And by the way, there are children right now who are suffering from severe malnutrition who will suffer permanent damage. If all the food in the world came in tomorrow, they have already been permanently damaged. So the word has got to go out that we must demand a total change in what Netanyahu is doing. We've got to put an end to this bloody war right now. Netanyahu and the Israeli government have got to start supporting the concept of a two-state solution so that maybe, maybe 
there will finally be peace in that region. I, I got to I mean, it seems like political pressure might be one thing to get the administration to take a more aggressive posture vis-a-vis -vis Netanyahu. And I wonder what you made of the results from the Michigan primary earlier this week. Over 100,000 people voting uncommitted as an effective protest vote against this administration. Well, policy. it tells me and I think it tells the White House that there are large numbers of young people, large numbers of minority people, large numbers of Americans who are sick and tired of the slaughter of the Palestinian people. And again, this is not some distant thing. This is with our tax dollars. Those guns and the planes largely or significantly are paid for by U.S. tax yes. dollars. So the word is, again, I mean, I, we cannot continue to support this right-wing extremist government. No more money. We must demand a fundamental change of policy. Do you think that this could be an issue that could decide the 2020, if not t entirely, you think this could be a deciding factor in the election? Well, I mean, people have got to know that, you know, Trump is, you know, even more pro-Israel than, than Biden has been. But I think what you're going to see is a lot of young people, mm -hmm. uh, people of color, uh, people of Arab descent saying, you know what, uh, I don't like Trump. But I just I'm not going to come out and vote. So it could be decisive in that in that sense. There's some data that The Washington Post went through. It's exit polling data comparing Trump's support in 2024 versus his support in 2016 from these early primary states. And it looks like he's running the same this year as he did with Republican women in 2016. He's gotten a higher share of conservative voters and older voters. He has done slightly worse among young voters. So it seems if you're a Democratic strategist, you're someone running for president, which you have done before, and you know this, you know the landscape well, young voters are going to be really important for this Democratic president who's seeking to return to office for another four years. <clears throat> Do you have, I mean, is there a strategy you think, President, setting aside the, Im the immediate calls that you have articulated vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, is there a strategy that President yeah. Biden should be pursuing outside of that? There is. Look, I think President Biden, President Biden has established a good record over the last four years. There's a lot that he has to be proud of. You know, we took this country under his leadership out of the pandemic and the economic downturn from the pandemic a lot faster than people thought. We have started to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. We're putting more money into transforming our energy system and dealing with climate change. He has been a strong supporter of women's right to control their own bodies, et cetera, et cetera. He has a good record. But I think what he's got to talk to the American people about is an understanding that despite our accomplishments over the last three and a half years, ordinary Americans have been hurting for decades. We don't talk about it. Real inflation accounted for wages today, Alex, are lower than they were 50 years ago. Yeah. We're seeing massive levels of inequality. The very, very rich are getting richer. Sixty percent of our people continue to live paycheck to paycheck. We have a health care system, which is dysfunctional, a child care system, which is collapsing. Meanwhile, the people on top doing phenomenally well. Corporate profits are soaring. I think the president has been good. He's been out on a picket line yeah. with striking workers for the first time in American history. I applaud him for that. He's got to get up there and say, look, I give me a second term. Give me real democratic control over the House and the Senate. You know what? We're going to take on the ruling class of this country. We're going to take on greedy corporations. And we're going to provide an economy that works for working people, not just the 1%. I think if he gets that message out, he could win this election. The yeas are 77, the nays are 13, and the bill is passed. That was the Senate last night kicking the can, if not down the road, then down the block. They passed a stopgap funding bill that President Biden signed this afternoon, and which delays a partial government shutdown for a whopping total of seven days. After that, there is yet another deadline later in the month, after which even more of the government money, which after more of the government runs out of money. For a pack with me now is Senator Bernie Sanders. Senator, what's it like trying to govern with a party that's not actually interested in governance? It is very distressing. I'll give you an example of it. Uh, I think most Americans know that our health care system is in disarray. It's outrageously expensive. We don't have enough doctors and nurses. People can't get an appointment, et cetera, et cetera. We tried. We really did on the committee. I'm chairman of the Health Education Labor Committee. We tried to do something big. We even had some Republican support. We tried to grow the number of doctors and nurses and mental health providers. 
tried to expand primary health care so people in, all over the country could actually go to a doctor when they needed to rather end up in a hospital at yep. 10 times the cost. Shut down. Total opposition from Republicans, most Republicans, not all, despite the fact this would end up saving money by keeping people out of hospital. Bottom line is, you're right, uh, they don't believe in the concept of government. At the end of the day, they'd like to see the corporate world take over even more of the functions of society. And that's the bottom line. Well, and that seems generous, that, that they want anybody to take over the functions of society, because honestly, it feels like social Darwinism to a certain no, degree, no, no. right? They want to privatize Social Security, they yeah. want to privatize Medicare, privatize the Veterans Administration, privatize public education, the post office. That is their ultimate goal. They're not happy that three people are more wealth than the bottom half of American society. Apparently, that's too fair. They want to make it even more unequal. Do, there's been a lot of hay geography around the retirement of Mitch McConnell from Senate leadership. And I wonder, as someone who works with the, the man and has seen of late um, his position on important matters, what you think of his departure and what the implications are for the Republican Party. I think it's going to be he is an old time Republican mm -hmm. and he is, to his credit, spoken up against Trump now and then. Um, that but, that's that alone feels like right. But quite, that's quite too liberal. Generous. Yeah, right. And um, I think he will be replaced by somebody further to the right, somebody who will be close, more closely attached to Trump. Do you, I mean, I, I have to say on a week like this where we're talking about just uh, like absolutely appalling conditions in Gaza, we're looking at the funeral of Alexei Navalny, we're looking at, you know, the seeming evaporation of holding Trump uh, criminally accountable for his actions, you know, in addition to the rest of the landscape. You forgot about climate change. Well, I mean, that's just an ongoing trauma that we're living through, right? Do you, does this moment, do you, do you have a, 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 a sort of core of optimism in a moment like this? Or how do you look at the broader sort of American and global landscape? Look, I have had the privilege, as you mentioned, of running for president, which means that I've been to every state in this country. I've talked to many, many thousands of people, young people, old people, working class people. And what I want to tell you is the people are far, far, far more decent than the government they have that's representing them. Almost everybody out there says, you know what? Healthcare should be a human right. Mm -hmm. Everybody out there says, hey, we gotta ask the billionaires to start paying their fair share of taxes. People all over the world are not stupid. They see climate change taking place in front of their eyes. We have got to deal with it. We need to improve education. We need to change our national priorities, not spend 900 billion on the military, et cetera, et cetera. So where I am optimistic, having talked to zillions of people, is people want to make this country a lot more humane society uh, and move away from the kind of oligarchic society that we have today. Okay, we're going to leave it on that optimistic note. Of uplift from <laughs> Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, whose best-selling book, It Is Okay to Be Angry About Capitalism, is out now in paperback. Is it not possible to do IVF in a pro-life way that treats embryos as children because they are? Does not wisdom cry unto us that if we have found a potential silent holocaust of our children that we should pause, just stop? I quoted Jack Reacher, I'll quote Vanilla Ice. Stop, collaborate, and listen. That was Alabama State Representative Ernie Yarbrough, a Republican, yesterday debating new legislation to protect in vitro fertilization while quoting both the Bible and vanilla ice. If it wasn't already clear, it's sort of a mess down in Alabama. And yet, somehow this week, Alabama's Republican-controlled legislature managed to pass something after the state Supreme Court ruled two weeks ago that frozen embryos are children and effectively ended access to fertility treatments. The new legislation, passed yesterday, aims to grant civil and criminal immunity to anyone providing IVF services, meaning doctors can't be sued if they give fertility treatments. But the legislation fails to address the fundamental question here. How does the state of Alabama define a child? Is an embryo created by IVF a person? And if you freeze an embryo, are you freezing a person? Meanwhile, at the U.S. Capitol, the cleanup effort is going even worse. Despite top Republicans in the country publicly pledging to support IVF after the Republican Senate campaign arm begged them to do so, earlier this week, Republican Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith blocked a measure that would have pro provided federal protection for IVF treatments. Cindy Hyde-Smith explained her position, saying, I support the ability for mothers and fathers to have total access to IVF and bringing new life into the world. 
I also believe human life should be protected. That sounds confusing and maybe somewhat hypocritical. That's because it is. Republicans appear to want it both ways here. They want to give lip service to IVF protections, but they also don't want to do anything to protect IVF. Joining me now is Erin Carmone, senior correspondent at New York Magazine and author of an upcoming book about the post-Dobbs era called Unbearable, Being Pregnant in America. That's an understatement. Erin, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, the thing about hammering home this notion that life begins at conception, which Republicans have been doing, I don't know, for decades, mm -hmm. is that eventually people start believing you. 49% <laughs> of Republicans think embryos are children. Mm -hmm. And here we are in a sort of situation that is wholly a Republican making. Is there a way out for them on this? Well, you know the famous New Yorker cartoon of, I never thought the leopards would eat my face. Yes. I keep thinking about that because, yes, there are some true believers like our Vanilla Ice fan friend, Ernie Arbro, who sincerely have thought through, maybe thought through the issues, and they really think that if you freeze a frozen, if you freeze an embryo, which itself can endanger its future, right, routine processes of IVF could result in the destruction of a fetus, even though the intention, in theory, is to build a family. But most of them haven't really thought about it at all. Yeah. And IVF, as we know, is overwhelmingly more accessible to people who are well off, would like to become parents, um, people maybe that people that lawmakers know. Uh, they realize that this is political poison. And so they never thought that the leopard would eat their face in terms of the actual political uh, popularity of yeah. this. Staring them in the face. Now, you rightly call out the total incoherence in what they're saying. And I think part of that is to paper over the fact that they actually haven't fully worked out what their position is. The Heritage Foundation thinks that the Alabama State Supreme Court decision was awesome. Yeah. You know, Alabama has passed this completely, the, the legislature has passed this completely incoherent thing that says that, like, for 15 months, nobody can be prosecuted. It doesn't even have a carve out for malpractice. Like, it really actually causes more problems than it solves. Um, but that is because they have not fully understood the implications of what they've said. But mind you, when Alabama was debating its abortion ban, there was a, a legislator, Clive Chambliss, who, Clyde Chambliss, who famously said, an embryo is not, it's not a baby because it's not in a woman. Right. You know, so they, they're, they have had times to try to say, well, if I don't, if I can't control a woman directly, <laughs> then it doesn't there's count. There's not a uterus that I can, so like, I, I think police. for them, they, exactly. They have not fully thought this through, but their own personhood laws, people like Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, have supported laws that would severely restrict IVF. So rather than kind of have this debate out in the open where a ton of people who are very powerful in the conservative movement are being like, yeah, Alabama right. State Supreme Court, they're just trying to say, IVF, it's great. And when you look into the fine print, if you even got something like a straight answer, you might find out that they support um, really unsustainable, difficult, like ineffective, expensive practices in IVF that anybody who has been through the process will know is the same as making it completely illegal. Available. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, um, one of the people who's been caught in a, a bind of his own making, quite literally, is Donald Trump. This is um, Sean Hannity asking Donald Trump about his position on IVF. I believe it was yesterday. Let us take a listen. You took a strong stand on IVF. Where are you on that? And what is your message to other candidates? And where are you on abortion? So I saw the IVF and a judge in Alabama made a very harsh decision. It was very, very tough. And I came out immediately and I said, we want to help women. This is fertilization. We want that. We want people to help. We're on the side of women. And same thing on the abortion issue. It's like... <laughs> You can see the wheels grinding in his, in his head, right? We want to help. We're in support. It's a heart. We want to help women on IVF and abortion because those are two areas we where we are actually circling the drain in terms of political support. They have uh, no for idea what they're No idea doing. what he's doing. So completely, completely incoherent. But, you know, it's amazing because in Alabama, for example, if you go back, part of the holding in the Supreme Court case was about um, 
rested on the fact that Alabama voters had basically voted personhood into the Constitution, right? If you go back and you look in 2018, the ACLU and Planned Parenthood was saying this is going to have consequences, not just for abortion, but for miscarriage care and other reproductive health care. Like, this is not a big surprise to anybody who's been paying attention. It's maybe a big surprise to them that they're paying the political price. But everybody who has been even remotely paying attention to this realizes the broad scope of reproductive control that they're actually talking about. The only reason they're backtracking is because they're getting in trouble for it right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, it also seems like all the tweets of uh, support for IVF are going to amount to hill of beans. I mean, I don't, do you have any expectation that any kind of legislative solve is on the horizon? Well, in Alabama, yes, they have this totally incoherent thing that will allow them to say that there's a legislative fix. But even if it were an effective legislative fix, you still are going to run up against these, frankly, theocrats on the Alabama State Supreme Court who made it very clear there was really only one dissent in that case, which made many logical points. Everybody else, the only question is, what was their reasoning in order to say that these embryos are extra uterine children who deserve protection under the wrongful death of a minor act of 1872, a time in which I think IVF was not yet contemplated? Oh, good old 1872. It dominates so much of our politics in the 19th century. Erin Carmone, thank you, my friend, for your time and great reporting. Great to see you. Thanks.